Hello viewers and welcome to Spotlight here on Hope TV where you look and leave and we are always very glad when you join us and also when you send us your views concerning the personalities that we bring to you on this program and so even on Spotlight here you are welcome to send us your views on this very inspiring discussion that's coming up. Uh, send us your views on 22232 that's our text message line. Also engage us on Facebook and Twitter as we talk about tree top. Now if you remember uh, way back in the 70s and 90s 80s uh, there was this brand of um, of 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 of, of a juice that was called treetop. It was a luxury, right? Not many homes had it. And uh, after some time, uh, treetop just disappeared. Uh, and one, everyone was talking romantically about how we used to take treetop on those bottles, which later on would be converted into uh, you know, containers to carry milk, if you remember that. And uh, then a few, uh, you know, year, a few months back, uh, we actually see treetop coming right back and we ask ourselves, wow, where did the treetop emerge from? And now on Spotlight, uh, on this edition, we are having the man who brought treetop back. It's none other than Bernard Njoroge, who is the managing director of Sky Foods Limited. Bernard. Thank you for having me. Welcome. Thank you. This is a handshake season, so yes, the, yes, that yes. handshake is strong. Yes, it's very strong. Thank, Thank you, you for me. bringing uh, Trito back. Thank you so much. You are the man. Yes, I am the man. Amazing. Yeah. You know, for many people who grew up in 70s, 90s, uh, Trito would be a luxury, right? Yes. And you remember the way it has this, this glass bottle yeah. uh, that would have it settle at the bottom. Yes. And you have to shake it, you yes. know? Yes. And then you have to, it was so concentrated, yes. you'd have to put a little amount, you know, yes. and then the rest is water. And of course, because it was a luxury, you have to take little, yes, little, exactly. little, because it was not commonplace. Yeah. And then here you are, I mean, after disappearing uh, for many years, you brought it back. Yes. Right? Now, Bismarck, what's the story behind bringing back Treetop. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, as you lightly said, um, Treetop was the only juice brand that was selling in Kenya in the 60s, the 70s, 80s, and the early 90s. And then it went out, I think, mid of 1995. And it exited the market for two reasons. Number one, remember it was a Unilever brand, okay? And it was the only juice brand that was being, being sold. Before then, the Kenyan economy was, uh, was not liberalized. It was a very controlled economy. And the, the price commissioner at uh, Treasury decided the price that every fast-moving consumer goods would be sold that included treetop. So the price he dictated that they should sell it for, and, uh, Unilever, when they looked at that vis-a-vis -vis their profitability targets, they realized you're not making enough profits. And that started triggering the whole idea of stopping treetop. Then number two, a, a new competitor came into the market, that was Quenta, and they brought in uh, the product in a plastic bottle. They brought in some innovation in terms of flavors. They brought in mango, they brought in uh, strawberries, et cetera, et cetera, and various pack sizes. If you remember, Treetop was in that glass, iconic bottle, mm -hmm, as you mm -hmm. like they said it, very iconic with a white closure. Yeah. And it was a squash, okay, very squash, very big squash with 25% juice content. And that's why you had to you had to dilute it because one bottle gave you four four liters of juice mm -hmm. when you add the water and it was absolutely delicious so that's how it, it came out of the market mm -hmm. yeah it could not be sustained because of uh, there was competition and those dictated a dictated price yeah exactly and of course mm -hmm. the other reason when they told me when i went to, to buy the brand they said they made a strategic decision not to be in the food and beverage mm -hmm. they realized from a global perspective and even from a local perspective in africa they could not compete with the big multinational companies like uh, Coca-Cola mm -hmm. and Del Montes. And they said, we will strictly pursue our detergents and household products and get away from food and beverage. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that's how the brand was packed and it stayed in their shelves for 19 years mm -hmm. until I knocked on the door and I said, may I acquire the trademark? Okay. Yeah. That's amazing. 19 years later. And uh, we're talking about a corporation here, Unilever. Big, big name. Yeah. Big multinational. And then uh, here comes Bismarck. Now, when you are asking for the brand or to revive Treetop, I mean, where were you coming from? I mean, did you, were you also running a huge multinational? Or where did Miss Bismarck come from when he came knocking? Yeah. 
The trigger was actually because of my long experience working with big multinational juice companies. Mm -hmm. I had worked in Del Monte for a very long period of time. I joined the company when I was 28 years old. I, I led the team that introduced the, the Del Monte range of juices in Kenya. And every time we would bring in a new product, we would get consumers into a room and would like them to taste the product, you know, blind tasting, so that we know for sure that the flavor or the taste that you're putting in the market is what the consumer is looking, is looking for. Mm -hmm. So during those sessions, over long periods of, of years, I would hear comments like, oh, this one tastes like treetop. What mm. happened to treetop? Why can't they bring it back? That is what planted the seed in my mind mm -hmm. that one day I would try and acquire the brand. Mm -hmm. So with that background, I decided uh, in late in 2011 to pursue Unilever and mm -hmm. ask them, would they be willing mm -hmm. to sell to someone the, the treetop name? And of course, I started using my lawyers and we started the whole process. And by 2012, mm -hmm. I acquired the trademarks the trademark for Unilever, for, for Treetop, which was in perpetuity, mm -hmm. royalty-free for the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. That was very bold of you. It, right? was, <laughs> it was very bold. <laughs> it was yeah. very bold. So it was very bold. I because how do you me. bring yeah. back a whole um, season of life, like a whole 70s and 80s and part 90s era as a lone man? <laughs> Yeah, it was, yeah. yeah, in fact, they used to ask me, Bernard, mm -hmm. are you out of your mind? Because since we stopped the brand uh, 19 years ago, there's no one who came knocking at the door to ask for the brand to be, uh, to, to buy the brand. Mm -hmm. They're asking, how come no one else? I mean, I mean, the other entrepreneurs who have been there before you, but mm -hmm. nobody ever asked us. We don't have any correspondence. I mean, we don't have any letter, even a simple inquiry. So you must be inspired by something bigger than, you, than yourself. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And uh, uh, when you got you know the the process going and you got the the brand now what was your vision my vision was to bring back a street up mm -hmm. and introduce uh, a lot of innovation around the brand mm -hmm. because i could see big possibilities i knew when it was there it was only orange mm -hmm. orange flavor and because of my experiences working for big multinational companies mm -hmm. that includes del monte and coca-cola and I had traveled to so many countries, mm -hmm. over 70 countries around the world, marketing the Monte and marketing uh, Coca-Cola. I had seen what is possible with a strong trademark. And I went for it and I said, when I bring it, I want to make it a number one juice brand, not only in Kenya, mm -hmm. but the entire of Sub-Saharan Africa, impacting millions and millions of, of people. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, uh, as you speak about it, uh, treetop, it's just a romantic memory for many people. It's yeah. like a memory for sure. But now here comes in, the, in 2012, it's a whole new generation. There's a generation that recognizes Treetop, but there's another that has no idea what Treetop was. Yeah. Now, how did you, or how do you continue to merge the two? Yeah. The generation that would recognize Treetop from the sh supermarket shelf, and the one that sees it as a brand new thing. How do you yeah, ask? That's, that's a very, that's a very mm -hmm. good question. And uh, the key motivating factor for me to acquire the brand is a new, Anybody who was past 30 years and above was brought up with treetop. So they remember it mm -hmm. because they were, they were brought up with it. Mm -hmm. And now they are the, the fathers and the mothers of the kids and they have the disposable income. They are either in business or working for other people. And if they find the products on the shelf, it will remind them of their youth when they were growing up. And I was relying on the fact that they will buy it and introduce it to their children with that very nostalgic feeling that I grew up with this brand mm -hmm. and it has actually worked. Okay, yeah. amazing. Because that was, that was a serious gamble when you think about it. Yeah, it was a business wise. Yeah, it was. That a, uh, the, the, the brand would uh, in, uh, provoke uh, s some memories uh, and then this memory will make it a family. Um, family product exactly. and good enough as you say it's worked it right? is work yeah amazing and let's let's talk about the scale of operations yeah uh, like how you began and where you are now yeah mm -hmm. um when i when i got the brand name i i initially i, I did a business plan and it took me one year to do a business plan mm -hmm. some entrepreneurs when they want to go into business they they imagine you can sit within a couple of weeks or a month mm -hmm. you have a business plan that convinces investors to come in on board it took me at least about a year because I'm a very honest man. I had an eight to five job. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to use the company time to do my private thing. So I could only dedicate that on one day in a week that is Saturday. 
And of course, you know, Sandy is a family man and mm -hmm. a very strong family person. Mm -hmm. And of course, very, very spiritual in terms of getting going to church and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it took me about a year to put together a business plan and I started knocking at doors for funding. And of course, the first places you, you go to are the banks. The banks don't want to see you because you, you are not tried, you're not tested. They won't touch you. The next place I went was the investment bankers. Uh, who I knew based on our may maybe in the networks I built mm -hmm. in college and all other, these other places. And after that, um, I went to what you call now uh, investor groups. There are certain companies, there are certain people who have come together. They have raised some money as uh, ordinary uh, groups, financial mm -hmm. groups. And I went to them and asked them, could you please come in and support the, the mm -hmm, plan. Mm -hmm. So that's how I did it. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's, that's uh, uh, quite something, when you, because the capital must be quite, uh, going, going into manufacturing any day is capital intensive. Yeah. And uh, uh, at that critical point, and this is something that would maybe interest lots of people, how, what informed uh, the kind of partners that you finally chose to be part of your brand? Um, I was looking for partners who would understand the bigger story and where we were going into. We had uh, done a business plan that said, guys, for the first three years of this operation, we're not going to be making any profit. There's, there's, a, there's a big story about it that we will have to invest for the long term, not for the short term. So mm -hmm. that's the worst, first thing I was looking for. Secondly, I was looking for people who are compatible, I would be compatible with. Uh, people who have got the same value system as mm -hmm. my value system. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I didn't want to be in a boardroom with people who have got different values. And there are quite a number of people who came in, I, I had to say no, because mm -hmm. I don't believe the, the values are compared with my values. Mm -hmm. And um, that's how I managed to put together a, a, a team of five investors that includes the Kenyan government through the state corporation of ICDC, mm -hmm. Industrial Commercial and Development Corporation. Mm -hmm. Because they are the first people I went into and I, I presented the plan and they said, yes, Bernard, you have a business case. So if you're able to fundraise all the money you're looking for, we will back it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Amazing. You know, and you mentioned value system yeah. quite a bit and we'll come to that a little later. Now, there, there is um, um, a whole, let me call it a wave mm -hmm. in the country and it's been for a while when talking about entrepreneurship, because uh, uh, now that the job market is what we call saturated, mm -hmm. and we are churning out lots of graduates every year, and now that they can't find jobs as quickly as, uh, as, as would be maybe in the past, now it seems like now they are being encouraged many times to get into entrepreneurship as if it is a secondary, an alternative to to, to, to employment. So it comes in almost as a second, right? Because yeah, yeah. the mentality of most people is that employment is first. Entrepreneurship is second. That if things don't work. And that's, uh, that's quite prominent in many minds, many minds in Kenya. I want to ask you a question as an entrepreneur. Uh, do you feel like entrepreneurship is primary? Is, it that, is that what people should have in the first place? Or... Should it be secondary as it's being propagated in yeah, the yeah, world today? Yeah, thanks very much for that. Mm -hmm. uh, according to me, in my opinion, mm -hmm. uh, entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurship should be the first option. Mm. I remember when I was a young man uh, going through primary school and secondary school, we used to be asked by our teachers, what would you like to be when you grow up? Mm -hmm. And mo most, most kids will say, I want to become a teacher, a lawyer, a doctor. Because at that time, when we were growing up, there, was, there were job opportunities available. But now, uh, 25 years later, the number of openings are, are not as, as many. And I see universities are churning up like 500,000 students mm -hmm, every year. Mm -hmm. They're not enough, there are not so many opportunities for those guys. So for me, I would encourage that people uh, consider entrepreneurship as a first option. Mm -hmm. And because that is what is going to drive uh, this nation. Mm -hmm. Because the, the companies that we have or the jobs that are in, available in the civil service cannot accommodate everyone. Mm -hmm. And I would even encourage uh, institutions like universities and also colleges to have even a course on entrepreneurship and mm -hmm. encourage as many people as possible to start that. Mm -hmm. In my, in my organization, in, and this is a part of our future plan, mm -hmm. is uh, we are developing a, an entrepreneurship incub incubation center mm -hmm. that will be under the Trito Foundation so that we can mentor and we can train mm -hmm. over 200 to 300 entrepreneurs who will work under my tutelage mm -hmm. and we will train them and then we place them in 
uh, you know, a company in various departments so that mm -hmm. we can they, they, they can learn entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. So by the time they graduate from the universities, mm -hmm. they have uh, somewhere to start, not like me who didn't have that kind of a training when I was a young person. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, that's 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 a revolutionary way of thinking, and uh, uh, because it just reverses the minds. Because when they grow up, most of the young people they even stay at home. They are relying on their parents to knock doors for them and then tell them that there's a job for you. And they just sit back and uh, think because they are controlled by that fast understanding that employment comes first. But if they were able to embrace your thinking, then you would realize that they should actually be on the go. <laughs> because, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm mm -hmm. looking at exactly like when, when they go for these long uh, holidays, you know, mm -hmm. the long session, six months to uh, eight months or something like that, mm -hmm. they need to come to us enrolled in our incubation, entrepreneurship incubation center, mm -hmm. which will start in the next 18 months or so. Mm -hmm. And then we start training. I'll start with a small group, but my vision is to see that number grow to 200, 300 people mm -hmm. every year. And that's the kind of impact that I would like to, to leave as part of my legacy mm -hmm. in trying to train the young people in this country. Okay, yeah. and there's no greater legacy than yeah, passing absolutely. on absolutely. the yeah. skill yeah. Yes. that made, uh, uh, you know, treat up what it is, yes. you know, today. Uh, now. Um, when in entrepreneurship, especially in the skill that you are in right mm -hmm. now and in manufacturing, definitely, and it's not a rosy story, there are some challenges that you face uh, and um, uh, some that are, you know, quite intense. Now, what are some of the challenges you faced along the way as yeah. you have, have you, as you developed the Trito brand? Yeah, that's a very good question, mm -hmm. Abri, because mm -hmm. um, when you decide to to leave your former employment and you go and start on your own, you are literally jumping off a cliff. Mm -hmm. And you're jumping off this cliff and at the back of your, of the back, you have your, your business plan or the tree top name for, for, uh, for me as kind of a parachute. And when you jump that off that cliff, be sure you're going to hit all the four walls of the cliff, the left, the right, uh, east, north, south, yeah, whatever it I is. I can imagine that. And make sure that you do not mm -hmm. hit Mm -hmm. You don't hit the, the ground. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that, that, that it is given. Mm -hmm. And they say that all the winners, they, they, they have a lot of scars. Every winner you see, mm -hmm. be it as a sports person or a business people, they all have got scars because mm -hmm. winners, have, we, we go through a lot of uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. The first challenge is phase number one was uh, I had raised all the, all the funds that I needed, mm -hmm. but I had uh, not factored in the amount of working capital required mm -hmm. to, to fulfill the demand of the product that we have. Mm -hmm. So that was a big, one of the biggest challenges, but over time we've been able to overcome that working capital. Mm -hmm. The second one was now to build a distribution. Remember you are up against big entrenched brands which are 25, 30 years old with big balance sheets and a lot of support and you're trying to build a parallel distribution to them. That was a big, another big challenge. The other challenge we had was um, now trying to assemble the team. Uh, I made some mistakes. Of course, I had uh, brought in some very expensive people initially who are not where to work in a startup. They would do very well in a company whereby all the systems are working and they're running. But when you bring into a startup, it requires a different kind of a skill set. Mm -hmm. And that was a big, uh, a big challenge. And of course, the, the competition, because you're up against 16, 17, 18 brands out in the market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Quite intense. You yeah. know, uh, are there some times, mm. uh, Bernard, mm. uh, in the course of your operations mm. and in the course of, you know, seeing your financials and in the mm. course of assessing the market and in the course of all these things, mm. are there some times when you have felt that maybe I should shut down? Not really, mm -hmm. because entrepreneurs, the real entrepreneurs are built with a lot of resilience. Mm. You, you have stopped working, you are working for yourself, you've got people you have employed, and you don't see any barriers. Mm -hmm. You really, you see a wall, you say, I must go through this wall. I never reached a point whereby I would say I, wouldn't, I want to stop it. Mm -hmm. Because I believe that I have something bigger. And you can see, this is our fifth year in business. So I have survived year one, two, three, and four. Mm -hmm. And most companies or most startups, they failed in their, in their second year anniversary. Mm -hmm. But for us, because of the resilience, because of the faith we have uh, with ourselves, the self-belief, we, we, we knew that we were going to make it. Mm -hmm. And of course, we had a lot of, uh, we, we, we've prayed a lot about this mm -hmm. business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am a very prayerful person. Mm -hmm. I would pray every morning before I leave the office. I would pray again when, you, when I get to the office. 
anytime you start to up a meeting, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the power of prayer has, has worked miracles because every intention of prayer that I've ever made, mm -hmm. I achieve those numbers mm -hmm. and achieve those, those uh, prayer requests. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm, I'm happy to say that. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's been a journey of perseverance and you think in terms of how, not whether. You know, how do exactly. we surmount this? Exactly. Not whether we should continue with this. Exactly. Uh, and and uh, Bernard, you can tell us about the scope now in the, the five years mm -hmm. that you, your treat, 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 treat up has been back. Uh, in terms of employees, how did you start and where are you at now? Yeah. In terms of markets, where did you start and where are you now? Yeah, yeah that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. uh, I was the employee number one that uh, joined the company. That is November 2014. And then I, I quickly brought in another two or three employees to help me set up the factory. Uh, I had a production guy, a uh, top, uh, top guy called Philip. And then I brought in a finance person and uh, a sales and marketing guy. And now, five years down the road, I have seen that employee grow from four or five employees at the beginning to 120 employees. Ooh. Yeah, 120 That's employees. That's amazing. If we were to yeah. uh, put per year, you know, it's been an increase of um, almost, uh, almost 20 employees per year. Yeah, almost know? 20 employees yeah. every year. Yeah. And now, you see, uh, we run the faculty every day, every day, day and night. We have three shifts. Mm -hmm. uh, one shift starts at 6 o'clock up to 1. Then we have another one starting at 2 to about 8 o'clock in the night. And another one comes at 9 up to the following day in the mm -hmm. morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and I feel incredibly uh, happy when I see all those, all those families we are supporting. Mm -hmm. Because you can imagine for every uh, employee we have, we have, he looks after about five, five people. Mm -hmm. So you can see the impact we have, we have created in terms of, of, of all that. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I look at the, the impact we have had on the people who supply us the packaging material. Mm -hmm. I'm buying uh, bottles, I'm buying labels, I'm buying cartons, uh, either locally or internationally. I'm bringing in uh, fruit pulps. We use, we use the real fruit in, in, our, in, our, in our beverages. And uh, the impact we have had is that we have, we have over 20,000 farmers that we are impacting directly mm -hmm. because we buy the, the mangoes from them and the mangoes are crushed into, mm -hmm. a, into a pulp and that is what finds itself into our, into our packs. Amazing. Yeah. You know, that's uh, uh, when you think about that ripple effect, uh, they are the employees yeah. and then they are the suppliers. Yeah. And all this began with a bold knock, you know, at Unilever. And yeah, look at five years later, what is very inspiring, definitely. Uh, and manufacturing, uh, Bernard, is not one of the options that, you know, an, an entrepreneur would be thinking about, especially, especially if it's a young graduate. Uh, usually, the, when you think entrepreneurship, you think the, the service industry. Uh, and now you dared into manufacturing. That looks like something uh, in the minds of many young Kenyans, like, Foreign investment, you know. <laughs> yeah, it is. Not, you think yeah. about mm. you know, buying machines and doing things, and sometimes that is not in the minds of uh, many, many young Kenyans. They think service industry, uh, and can you maybe demystify um, whether your background is in engineering, you know, yeah. whether is your background, whether your background is in you know food production, for you to be able to uh, mm. have the boldness to enter into manufacturing. Yeah, yeah. Thank mm. you very much, Bri. I can tell you, my my background, I trained. Uh, in marketing, uh, sales and marketing, I did a business degree. So I should have been a guy who is selling, you know, driving a van mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and selling products uh, across Kenya. I am not an engineer. Uh, I'm not a food technologist. I trained in, in, in marketing. But I had this, uh, this conviction inside me that I could do a manufacturing uh, a business. Mm -hmm. And it's because I had also worked in big multinationals that have a lot of manufacturing uh, capabilities mm -hmm. and I learned but I want to demystify for young people watching out there it is not nuclear science you don't need to be an engineer to be able to put up a factory when the time came for me to put in a factory I knew the people who are trained in, in, in engineering and I got my my consultant engineer Washira who came and helped me put the factory together in terms of employing the food technologists I looked around all the universities in Kenya are training food technologists and I went looking for the guys with the passion and the value system that like myself, and I brought him on board. So you don't have to be trained as an engineer, mm -hmm. or you don't have to fear that you, uh, you're going into, into, into manufacturing. You just need to, to get the right team together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you inspire them so that the very best in them can come out. Mm -hmm. And that is what I've done in, in Sky Foods Limited. Amazing, yeah. because you are a marketer, and then you have now engineers, and you have 
uh, production, you know, food production people. And that, that should shape perspective uh, on young people because uh, some time back I was talking to um, a young woman who her passion is really to take care of mothers who have um, had miscarriages. And that's her passion. She's a computer engineer. But she now runs an, orga an organization where she engages doctors, engages a uh, psychologist, all those, but herself, she's not in yeah. medicine. So the same thing I see here, that you are in marketing, uh, but your dream, you know, gathers all the engineers, you know, under you and yeah. get, gets all these uh, scientists under you. And that should be an eye opener, that you do not need to be an engineer for you to have a manufacturing dream. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And what I would tell uh, the viewers is that when you discover your passion, mm -hmm. okay, and you, you pour your heart into it and all your energy into it, the universe will conspire and mm -hmm. make your dream come true. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to have trained in engineering, you don't have to have trained in food technology, you don't have trained in electrical engineering. All those pieces will, will come into place because you have discovered what your passion is mm -hmm. and you have told the universe what this vision is and it will come and help you. Okay, yep. that's powerful, you yeah. know. Uh, and uh, just before you go for a break, um, the mental part, you've dealt with it. Now, sometimes the same young people would feel, hey, the capital outlay must be really, really huge. Is there a small way of starting a manufacturing unit? Yes, there, there, mm -hmm. are, there are various options of starting a manufacturing unit because you don't even need to own those big factories. If you have an idea of a product you'd like to manufacture, I, I bet you there are many companies that are probably making similar products and they are sitting on excess capacity. And you can approach these companies for contract manufacturing. If you just place a good business plan on their table and they'll see the value that you're bringing in, obviously they will contract manufacture for you. Mm -hmm. And there are so many people sitting on idle capacity. If you look at our, our, tetra, our tetra juice, we, we have signed up uh, various contract packing agreements with, with various companies. Number one is Qual that is making, making it for us. Mm -hmm. We have other factories across Africa that are talking to us in Nigeria, in Ghana, in South Africa. And they are willing to come. Mm -hmm. Bernard, bring the treetop in South Africa. Bring the treetop in Ghana. We have the manufacturing platforms. We can make it for you. So for the young people who have interest in manufacturing, they should not fear that mm -hmm. you need a million or two million dollars to start a manufacturing concern. You can do contract manufacturing with the people who have got the capacities. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I'm willing to help them if, uh, because I really want to touch as many lives mm -hmm. as possible. Okay. I'm willing to help them. You know, uh, Bernard, I hope you're talking to many young people, not, just, not even in high school, even in primary school, for the imagination to begin being shipped at that level. Because what happens about the generation today is that they are catching things pretty early, you know? Yeah. And for that manufacturing mind to begin being formed, the primary school yeah. is really the right place. Yeah. I hope you're speaking to, you know, young people in high schools, and I hope you're speaking to people in even communities and universities, because that shift of mind is really, really important. And uh, uh, unless somebody who has, who is going through it, is able to come out as an exhibit, then the traditional way of thinking, uh, where employment is the primary mm. thought mm. Uh, of a livelihood, will continue to uh, be in the minds of many young people here, which, as you say, should not be. Entrepreneurship should be primary. Now, um, just tell us, again, before you go sh for a short break, uh, where is Treetop? Treetop is in Kenya. Where yeah. else is it? Yeah, we, we, we started selling in Kenya, that mm -hmm. is four years ago. Yes. And we are available everywhere. Mm -hmm. We have reached about 75% of the, of the Kenyan, uh, Kenyan, Kenyan uh, economy. Mm -hmm. We are in places like Lodua. Mm -hmm. you, you find us in Mombasa. You find us in Embu, Meru. All the major urban areas, mm -hmm. we, we are there. We are selling in Uganda. Mm -hmm. We have started shipping into Rwanda this month. And I'm doing, I'm doing a deal with the DR Congo before the end of, uh, of June. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tanzania we were, but now because of the trade, the trade uh, challenges between Kenya and, and Tanzania, which we are hoping to, to have been sorted out by the end of this month, mm -hmm. will be in Tanzania in July. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. And that's five years, right? It's five years, yeah. <laughs> and then your products. Yeah. Uh, the products we have, we have mm -hmm. four types of products. We have the, the Kodio. This is the dilute to taste because we could not bring treat back without having that uh, diluted taste. 
and we had to go for the original recipe for, for it from the suppliers in, German, mm -hmm. in Germany. Then we he brought innovation in terms of ready to drink. We brought ready to drink orange, we have mango, we have tropical, and we have apple. Then we decided to now bring in the tetra packs because uh, there are some consumers who would feel that I am not a consumer for products packed in a bottle. I would rather buy it in a tetra pack. So we brought in the tetra pack. We also the orange, the mango, the apple, and the tropical. Mm -hmm. And then of course we have the purified drinking water. We invested heavily in a, in a reverse osmosis uh, process of purifying water. And we said, let's also give the consumers, because there are other people who will never drink juice either because of their health conditions. Mm -hmm. But water is purified. Water is good for your health. Mm -hmm. So those are the four type of products we have. Okay. Yeah. A fantastic journey. Very inspiring. Yeah. And viewers, we are talking to Bernard Njoroge, who is the managing director of Sky Foods. And he is the one who brought Trito back after 19 years of absence. And when we come back, we'll be engaging an important part of Bernard's life, and that's his, his value system. Stay with us. This is what's like. We'll